this morning's presentation comes from Jonathan Corbett, um, who's a Linux kernel developer, co-founder of LWN.net, and uh, it appears the author of its kernel page and the lead author of Linux Device Drivers, the third edition. He lives in Boulder, Colorado, which must be a little bit cold around about now. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Jonathan Corbett. All right, well, good morning. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here as always. I am here to talk about the kernel. I've um, chosen to organize the talk in terms of challenges facing the kernel because I think by looking at the challenges that you face, you can see the directions that you're going to have to take in the future and where things are going to go. So as I wave my hands and try to predict where things are going to go, I just work from the same information that we all have and um, make my best guesses. First of these challenges is what I call vitality. We've got a development process and a development community that we all depend on to keep our kernel moving forward and evolving and serving our needs. If we don't see to the vitality of this process, if it's not staying strong, then we could have trouble. Now, back in 2005, Andrew Morton made a rather ill-advised statement to a, to a newspaper in Germany, I believe, where he said that he thought that the volume of patches going into the kernel was going to drop off one of these days because we were actually going to finish this project sometime. So one can think, okay, this is cool, we're going to finish. But if you're worried about the vitality of your development process, then you should really worry about a day that comes where we say, okay, you know what, we've run out of ideas. We don't have anything else to do. We're done. We're going to all go off and do WordPress plugins now or something like that. <laughs> so um, has that actually happened? Here is a plot of patch volume versus kernel release. We're talking about 2.6.11 over here up to the in-progress 2.6.33 kernel there. So it's the number of patches that went into each kernel release. When Andrew talked about the patch volume dropping off was here at 2.6.14. So what we can immediately conclude from this is that Andrew was wrong, right? We've gone from just under 4,000 patches that went into 2.6.14 up to kernels that routinely go over 10,000 patches and often up to about 12. We have not dropped off in patch volume. We have instead tripled it. Now, another way to look at this, this is now looking over the course of the last year, or just over a year, since the 2628 kernel came out at the end of December 2008. In this period of just over a year, we've seen 55,000 individual changes merged into the mainline kernel. Okay. These changes came from 2,700 developers. It's a, a huge development community. 2,700 people put in changes into the kernel. They represented a minimum of 370 employers. Those are just the ones that we were able to identify actually looking at this. And over this period of time, the kernel grew by 2.8 million lines of code and such. So in other words, we've got a process that is merging 144 change sets every single day and adding over 7,300 lines of code to the kernel every single day. This is, um, by the way, not taking breaks for holidays or weekends. This is every day. This is a development process that's clearly quite alive and quite active. It is, I think, probably unique in the free software world and maybe in the wider world beyond that. It can sustain a rate like that. So where does this code come from? Here's the plot that I like to put up, or the table I like to put up. It hasn't changed a whole lot over recent years. This is, again, over the same one year and some period since 2628. So we're seeing just under 20% of the changes going into the kernel coming from people who are known to be working on their own time, which is a fairly large amount when you think about it. Just about everything else, a minimum of about 75% of the code going into the kernel comes from people who are paid to do this work. So we see a lot of companies that you would expect, and of course, 350 or so of them that didn't fit onto the slide. Um, I just don't want to use fonts that small. But the, the real picture that you see here is one of a large number of companies, companies that compete with each other fiercely in the commercial sphere all cooperating very well on this common resource at this level. It works very well. So what have they done over the last year or so? Here's the whirlwind tour of what we've done over the last year. Again, starting with 2.6.28. 2.6.28 saw the addition of a memory management module called GEM. This is um, GPU graphics processing unit memory management uh, for Intel processor, Intel graphics chipsets in particular. This was the beginning of the end of a multi-year process of getting proper 3D graphics support into the Linux kernel. It's taken us a very long time. 
and this was the, sort of the beginning of the culmination of that, of that project. The ext4 file system lost its experimental designation in 2628. We'll come back to ext4 later, of course. The, the staging tree was added in 2628. The staging tree is a separate part of the kernel tree, which is meant to be a temporary home for code which is not up to the normal quality standards that we insist on for kernel code. The benefit of many years of experience has told us that code which is in the mainline kernel tree evolves and improves much more quickly than code that is often some other repository elsewhere, even if that is still freely licensed, freely developed code. So in response to that, we decided to, to go ahead and bring this code into the kernel, into the staging tree, where it becomes visible, it can be worked on, and it can improve. Much of the 2.8 million lines of code that I cited before, having gone into the tree over this period of time, has come in by way of the staging tree. It's just a vast amount of stuff that is brought in. Um, some of it has improved and moved on to the main line. Some of it has sort of languished and is perhaps being dropped out of it. And a lot of it is there and being worked on. But the process does, in fact, appear to be working in that regard. We also got support for wireless USB devices. These are devices communicating with a peripheral by way of an ultra-wideband radio link. Not sure how many of those are actually out there yet, but um, they do exist. Moving on, in March, we had the 2629 kernel. This kernel got a, um, a very special mascot associated with it for one release. This is due to the sort of ugly events that happened at LCA a year ago <laughs> that are really kind of best forgotten at this point. Um, 2629 got the kernel mode setting code. This is the other half of the 3D graphics picture, bringing in control of the, of the hardware to the kernel like any other device driver. It enables a whole lot of things and is, was a very important step forward, the, the end of, a, of an awful lot of work. We had a couple of file systems merged for, for this kernel, including ButterFS, which I'll come back to, and SquashFS, which is a compressed read-only file system used for things like live CDs and all that. This is another piece of code that had been distributed by distributors and others for a long time, finally found its way into the mainline. We also got support for the WiMAX broadband protocol. And if you're one of those people with a 4,000 processor laptop, you can, um, you can run Linux on it much more nicely now due to a number of changes that went into this kernel. Okay, then in June, we saw 2630. A couple of security-oriented modules went in there. Tomoyo Linux is a, a mandatory access control module based on path names. It was merged for 2630. We saw, also saw the addition of the integrity measurement module, which uses the, the trusted platform module chip in a computer to verify the integrity of the files upon which the system is built. So a system can actually boot up, convince itself that nothing in there has been modified and actually even perform remote attestation to, to remote um, sites that it has, it has its integrity intact. This can be very useful, I suppose, if you're trying to build an ATM based on Linux, for example, or something like that. Uh, that sort of important thing. It also can be very useful for the implementation of all the sort of anti-features that we heard about earlier this morning. It's very much a two-edged sword and um, could be very easily abused. I haven't seen much of that happening yet, but um, that potential is always out there. We saw the addition of support for the newer Radeon graphics chipsets and the addition of another file system, one called NILFS. NILFS is a log-structured file system. It's aimed at, at solid-state devices and, and related sorts of things. And it's got some nice features, some good snapshotting capabilities, things like that. Went in for 2630. Moving on to September in 2631, perhaps the most significant addition to 2631 was the performance counter module, something I'll come back to later on. This is access to initially low-level performance monitoring support in the hardware. Um, you can do char devices in user space if you really want to. I'm not sure that too many people actually want to. KMEM leak is a um, debugging tool for finding memory leaks in the kernel. It actually uses some very interesting sort of mark and, and sweep garbage collection techniques that you wouldn't or normally expect to find in the kernel. And in fact, you don't use it on a production kernel. But it's, it's very useful for, for debugging things. We saw the addition of TTM, which is the Radeon equivalent of the GEM module for memory management and kernel mode setting for Radeon chipsets. Again, more 3D graphics support. And the addition of, of support for better understanding the, the topology of our storage devices, be they some complicated RAID array or a, or a flash device or something like that. It helps the kernel a lot to know how that device is organized so that you, we can use it in the most efficient way. That went in for 2631. The current kernel is 2632, which came out in December. So a lot of things that went into here, including a bunch of block scalability work, I'll touch on that, 
lot of work on the performance counter subsystem. A new focus, if perhaps brief, on improving scheduler interactivity which came as a result of a sort of competitive scheduler posting from outside. Kernel shared memory is a virtualization technique that I'll come back to. And HW poison is a high availability mechanism which allows the system and the processes on it to continue operating in the face of, of hard memory errors on the system whenever possible. So that went in. And that's our current kernel. It's kind of the state of the art. It's where our development process has taken us. But the next kernel at this point is pretty easy to talk about because the merge window is long since closed and it's in the stabilization phase. 2633 will come out probably around the beginning of March. Uh, Perhaps the most important feature in this is the dynamic F-trace stuff. I'll come back to tracing technology. We got a new distributed storage device that went in to 2633. IO bandwidth controller is a virtualization technology that, again, I'll come back to, allowing administrators to, to control the bandwidth used by, by groups of processes on the system. TCP cookie transactions is a, a modification to the TCP protocol, which provides better scalability in the presence of very large numbers of connections and also better resistance to denial of service attacks. That, that feature is not complete as of 2633, but a lot of the groundwork is there. And then the sort of the surprise feature that came in for 2633 is the Nouveau driver, which is a reverse engineered driver for NVIDIA chipsets. The Nouveau developers were not expecting to merge this code in 2633. They were um, kind of thinking they would take a little bit longer, but then Linus threw a fit when it didn't show up in the in the pull request and screamed and yelled and jumped up and down. And so they, they scrambled and fixed it up and got that code in. So as of 2.633, we will have support for NVIDIA-based graphics um, with a free driver in the kernel. It's still a work in progress, but for a lot of hardware, it works reasonably well, and it's improving quickly. So we got a lot going on. And getting back to vitality, it seems to be working. In fact, at the kernel summit about two months ago in Tokyo, Developers came together and we talked about the process and the conclusion that we came to there was that in fact the, the process is working well. The, the vitality of the process is, is strong and there are really no major changes that need to be made at this time. Uh, we can always tweak things, but as a whole things are working pretty well. That said, there are various concerns that can be raised. The one that I'm going to focus on for just a moment is participation. This is a cooperatively developed process. It's a community project. It really only works if we all take part in it, if we all participate. As soon as we have actors who are working outside of the process, who are keeping their st stuff separate, who are not working with us, we have trouble for them and for us as well. And so to, to illustrate this, let's go back to this picture here. Um, there are a lot of fairly famous faces here that people recognize. A number of them are present at this conference. The one that I have circled here, this guy may not be familiar to a whole lot of people. His name is Mike Wachison. He is the leader of the internal kernel group at Google. He's the guy who's responsible for producing kernels that they run on however millions of machines they have this week on their, their worldwide cluster. And he talked about the, the approach that they had taken, which involved stabilizing on old kernels and keeping all of their work that they needed separate outside of the kernel. As of this talk, they had been working for about a year trying to pull themselves forward to the leading edge 2626 kernel but um, they had put a lot of effort into it and it was still proving hard. And part of the problem was that they're dragging forward a full 1,200 patches that they had applied to the kernel, about half a million lines of code. They have made their own changes to, um, to make it work the way they want to. Includes a whole lot of backports of features from newer kernels because they're stabilized on this old one. And all the sorts of problems that you run into. Stuff that they have duplicated with development that was done outside, stuff that's incompatible with the directions the kernel has taken since they did this, and just a whole lot of work. He has a team of about 30 engineers doing this. It has proved to be a very costly and difficult decision for Google to have taken, to have done things this way. They have understood this at this point and have made a decision to try to change that, to come closer to the community, to get their code upstream, and to work with the development community in a much more a uh, much closer sort of way. This is a process that a lot of companies seem to need to go through. Some of them are faster at it than others. But um, the, the faster we can get them through this, the, the better our whole process works and the better off we all are. So that's what I have to say about vitality. Next challenge is scalability, dealing with big machines. Um, if we think back to the good old days, when the 2.0 kernel came out back in June of 1996, 
this kernel would actually scale to two CPUs. This was a big iron feature. Um, and it worked well if you had the right workload. Now, of course, um, you probably have two CPUs sitting in your pocket, maybe more than that on your lap. Desktops easily have eight CPUs in them. Servers can have 32 and more, and so on. And you've got people, like I say, running 4,000 processor systems. So things grow over time. And every time we have to deal with larger systems, we have to deal with various sorts of bottlenecks that pop up that um, weren't there on the previous generation of hardware. So if you just I couldn't possibly talk about all the stuff that's been done. But you look at a few things that are sort of recent or ongoing. The restructuring of the work queue code within the kernel, because otherwise we get lots of processes for every CPU on the system. More CPUs, more processes. The resources needs go up. Multi-queue networking was added just over a year ago. This allows the kernel to drive high-end network adapters using more than one processor on the system. The only way to do that is to have multiple transmit queues so that each processor can manage its own queue. Otherwise, it just doesn't scale right. The reworking of the CPU mass stuff it was done by Rusty and others to um, just to change this data structure, which just represents all the processors on the system. As the number of processors grows, the data structure grew, and it wouldn't fit on the kernel stack anymore. So we had to fix it. There's, this just goes on forever. It's a, it's a game of whack-a-mole. As, as you go on, you run into more scalability issues. Some of the current moles look like this. Um, the decache lock is a core lock in the virtual file system layer for managing directory entries and a lot of other things. It's proving to be a scalability problem on a lot of I.O. heavy uh, workloads and also in the real-time tree. There are patches out there to fix it, but this is a really messy problem due to the fact that the semantics of this particular lock were not very well defined. And so there's a lot of things that have to be sort of un untied from each other. It's going to take a while. Networking again, we can drive a 10 gig Ethernet adapter at full wire speed and do it pretty nicely, even with often with a single CPU. But that's really only true for sending really big packets. Right? If you're doing big file transfers, it works really well. If you're sending lots of tiny little packets, then things don't always work very well. And of course, the problem is that there are workloads that want to do exactly that. So that, that's going to take work to, to nail all that down. I'm not quite sure how all that's going to be solved. Um, solid state storage devices are an interesting challenge that I'll come back to again. But if we think about it in this context here, we're, we're heading towards devices that can do 100,000 block I.O. operations per second. Compare that to your typical rotating disk drive, which could do at best hundreds of operations per second. Anytime you jump three orders of magnitude in capability, you're going to run into to bottlenecks that you didn't have before. Things that were totally acceptable overhead at 100 operations per second are just crippling at 100,000 operations per second. The result of this is that the block layer is going to end up looking an awful lot more like the networking code over time. The networking developers have had to deal with these sorts of high operations rates for many years. The, the block developers are just getting there now. So if you look, for example, at the 2632 kernel, so the addition of, a, of an interrupt mitigation module or some interrupt mitigation code in the block layer just so you don't get interrupts with every block transfer, it was taken directly from the, the networking code. It was, they used the same techniques that were, the networking developers had to do, geez, it was probably the better part of 10 years ago at this point, to, to solve this sort of problem. We're going to see more of that as the block layer becomes much more streamlined to deal with this kind of device. Okay, When we talk about scalability, um, I always like to remind people that scalability is a two-way thing. If you only scale to really big systems, then you aren't really scalable. You're just big, right? But we're trying to, to run Linux on small things. We've got the quarter of us with root on our telephones and so on. And we need to continue to work in that mode as well. This plot, which maybe you can actually even see, was generated by a tool called Bloatwatch, run by Matt Makel. What we have here, if you just look at the top line across the plot, this, we're going from the 2613 kernel here to something fairly recent over here, it's 32 RC1. It's just showing the size of a minimally built kernel, the smallest kernel that you can make. How much memory does it require? So we see that over time, in fact, our kernels are getting bigger. This is not entirely surprising. We're adding features, we're doing things. But the point is that the, the amount of resources it takes to run our, run our kernels is growing over time. So far, it's growing less quickly than the hardware we run it on is growing. We're doing OK. We're being saved by Moore's Law and all that. But this is a concern. It's always something that we need to keep our eyes on. And um, we could really benefit in this regard from more participation from the embedded world, which is getting better, but still is not as good as we would like. 
the way that you get the kernel to meet your needs is to be part of the process and to drive it the way you want it to go. That's how you get your vote. So people who are concerned about this really need to be part of the process and help to drive it that way. Okay, moving on to storage, which is, in a sense, a scalability-related challenge and some other things, right? Our storage devices are getting bigger. They're not always getting faster, which adds problems of its own, but they are getting bigger. The uses patterns are changing. We used to have lots of little files. Unix was designed for a system with lots of very little files, right? Now we have lots of very big files, and again, we've got the solid state storage device challenges coming as well. So the short-term response for this is the um, ext4 file system. ext4 is the next step forward of the ext3 file system that runs most Linux systems now. It brings a lot of advantages, much better performance. They've lifted a lot of limits on things like file size and file system size, all those sorts of things, while still providing awfully good compatibility with the ext3 file system. It's pretty stable. The more community-oriented or development-oriented distributions have been installing ext4 for a while now with generally good results. It works well, but the patch rate is still reasonably high. It's still stabilizing, and um, the, say, the enterprise market perhaps hasn't quite decided to use it yet, I don't think, but we're getting there. Ted will be talking about this later today and what's being done to get ext4 ready for that, that part of the market. should be a very interesting talk. EXT4 is good stuff, but it's also kind of the last step in of an approach to file systems that we've been carrying forward for, for decades, really. Um, it's seen, it's a, it can be seen as a sort of a stopgap, even if it's a multi-year stopgap that we'll be running for quite some time. The longer-term future may well be belong instead to a file system called ButterFS. This is a totally new file system written using more contemporary design ideas was initially started by Chris Mason at Oracle. It's now being developed by, by engineers from a number of companies, all of whom are interested in this. Again, it brings a lot of the advantages you'd expect, like better performance and such. It brings full checksumming of both data and metadata. So if you're really concerned about the integrity of your data on disk, uh, ButterFS can assure that for you. It's got a nice snapshotting feature built into it, so you can take quick snapshots of the state of the file system, come back to them later. Fedora 13 may actually include a feature where you can use the snapshotting feature of ButterFS to, to keep the state of your system before a system update, update the system, and then if you don't like what you got, which if you're, say, running Rawhide happens fairly often, then you can um, roll back to the previous state of the snapshot and pick up where you were before. Very nice feature that would be nice to have. Um, it also has some interesting internal volume management features, RAID actually built into the file system. If you look at what they're going to do with this, in fact, it makes some sense. You can do a lot of things. You can optimize a lot of things if you understand what the layout of your storage topology is from within the file system. ButterFS went in for 2.629, but it's not really meant for use by people who actually want to keep their data at this point. It's there for people who want to work on it, make it better. It's going to be quite some time yet before I think it's considered truly stable for, for production use. But it's, it's getting there, and the long-term future may well be this. So again, come back to one last time, the, the issue of solid state storage. People will tell you that the rotational media is dying. In fact, it's not going to die anywhere near as quickly as, as some people may think. But that said, solid state devices are definitely moving up into the market. They're, they're fast, they're quiet, they're cool, they um, are shock resistant, they don't take much power. A lot of nice features that come with these. But um, they have their ups and downs. Right. There have been some interesting performance issues with some of these devices, especially over time. They fast when you first get them, they slow down later on. And there have been some real issues with some of the, the features, such as the, the trim or discard feature, which is meant to be a performance enhancing feature, but um, do both to the way it's specified and the way it's implemented, uh, can actually hurt performance if you're not very careful in how you use it. So there's a lot of issues in dealing with this kind of storage that have to be dealt with. And we'll get there. We're working on it. Um, Matthew Wilcox will be talking about this tomorrow. He knows a lot more about it than I do. So if you're interested in this, I recommend going to that talk to, him, to hear about that. And that's pretty much what I have to say about storage. Next area of interest is visibility. Looking into the state of the system, seeing what's going on there, um, something that there's been an increased call for in recent years. What do we want to know about our systems, even our production systems, right? Why is, what is this system doing? Why is it slow? How come things slow down when this particular workload hits, something like that? Where should we be 
focusing our optimization efforts and do those efforts work? What changes have we seen? Things like that that we would really like to be able to answer by looking under the hood inside a running system and seeing what's going on. And of course, there's the other unstated question, which is how do we get all those smug D-Trace users to be quiet and stop bugging us about how their tool is better than ours? Although they seem to have gotten quieter recently. But um, anyway, the, for years, the, the stated solution to this has been a, a module called System Tap. System Tap is a, a tr dynamic tracing facility that looks an awful lot like D-Trace in this feature set. It's got some features that D-Trace doesn't have. Um, very powerful environment but it's been held back by a couple of problems. It's very hard to use, and there's been a real disconnect with the kernel development community, so it hasn't been carried forward the way you would think. It's not used all that much by kernel developers. It hasn't progressed the way a lot of people would have expected it to progress at this point. Nonetheless, it's still out there. It's being, being worked on. They just released version 1.1 a few days ago that has some new features and some security fixes and things like that. It's, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. But a lot of the energy has instead moved over to a system called F-Trace. F-Trace was just merged into the kernel a little over a year ago. It's a, a very lightweight tracing facility. It was developed with kernel developers in mind. It's very easy to use. You can use it on an embedded system without having to install any extra tools at all. You can use it with CAT. Um, it's got a lot of static tracing options for tracing sources of latency in the system or just tracing function calls, various things you want to do in the kernel. With the 2.6.33 kernel, it has also gained dynamic tracing, which is one of the big features that it lacked. So if you want to trace a particular point in the kernel and there is no trace point there, you no longer have to rebuild your kernel to add that trace point. You can simply stick a probe there in a running system and then use F-Trace to treat it like any other trace point in the kernel. This is going to be a killer feature, I think. It's the ability to add a print K to the kernel anywhere you want without having to reboot. Um, it's going to be a very nice thing to have once all the tools around it get, get into proper condition. This is where the action is. This is where things are moving very quickly. And I suspect that the real tracing facility that we use in the future is going to be based on this and not on system tap, or at least based on this and um, an associated module, which now has been rebranded to perf events. It was initially merged a couple of releases ago as the, um, as the perf counter subsystem. It was meant to provide access to, to low-level performance monitoring registers find in the CPU. How many clock cycles did this particular function call take? How many cache misses did we have? Things like that. It's been, it's since then, been expanded. It's been integrated with trace points in the kernel so that you can monitor any kind of event in the kernel that you would assign a trace point to. It's become sort of the, the central data collection and statistics gathering mechanism for much of the kernel. It, again, is moving very quickly. There's a lot of stuff happening with it, and you can do some cool things. Um, I really recommend seeing Paul's talk on Friday. He's been doing a lot of this work on, on um, perf events, and um, should have some interesting things to say. There's a lot going on in this area. And that's pretty much what I had to say on tracing and visibility. Next challenge is response, real time. Uh, I always feel the need to say when I talk about real time, we're talking about deterministic response, the, the knowledge that you can get a system to respond to you within a bounded period of time. It is not about speed. In fact, Paul McKenney sometimes gives us a talk about real time versus real fast and the, the trade-off that you sometimes have to make between the two. So real time is not for people who want speed. Real time is for people who want determinism. And this comes in, in a couple of very interesting ways. You see it uh, in gadgets and other sort of traditional sorts of embedded system sorts of things. If you're a musician and you're playing this here Linux-based Yamaha keyboard, when you press down some keys and ask for a chord, you want it to come out within a bounded period of time. You really don't want it to go off and think about it for a while. Um, it tends to really mess up your rhythm. So, um, so real time is very useful in a situation like that. Pretty much every flat screen TV has Linux in it every now, at this point. They have to deal with things like frame events and so on. So it's very useful in this environment. But the other big use for real time, which I think was a surprise even to a lot of the real time developers initially, is in the, the high end enterprise financial services area. If you're doing automated trading systems and so on, and you're trying to respond to real world events so that you can make trades and so on, you want to know you'll get your response in a bounded period of time. There's real money at stake. So there's a lot of commercial interest. A lot of the, in fact, a lot of the commercial interest in real time is coming from this area. A lot of banks are using this and so on. Thanks to Linux, we can all be proud that we can crash our financial system much more efficiently than we ever could in the past. So, um, 
The response to this has been a patch set called the Real-Time Preemption Patch Set. The goal was to bring deterministic real-time response to Linux, something that a lot of people said was impossible. You, that nobody has ever had a combination of a general purpose kernel and deterministic response. But um, they've pretty much done it, at least if you've got the right hardware. You can do this now with Linux. It's a very large out of tree patch, but it's been shipped by all kinds of distributors, both in the embedded world and um, in the enterprise world. A lot of this stuff has moved into the main line over time. Um, don't really need to go into these threaded interrupt handlers, the, the, the mutex layer for mutual exclusion, priority inheritance, a feature that Linus Torvalds once said would never ever go into any kernel that he had anything to do with, but they managed to slip it in anyway. And a lot of latency reduction work and so on, they initially came out of that tree. Ftrace too came out of the real time tree initially. Um, what's left, the biggest thing is a, is a technology called sleeping spin locks. Spin locks being the lowest level of synchronization within the kernel. Um, if you're trying to do deterministic response, you can't allow any piece of code to be non-preemptible. You have to always be able to push something aside and go to a more important task. The sleeping spin lock code allows that to happen. It's a very invasive and scary sort of patch. It's always been sort of saved for last. Some of the precursor work for this went in for 2633, though, and sort of beginning to mark spin locks as different kinds, the kinds that can sleep, the kind that can't. So we're getting there, and it might just happen this year, but I've been saying that for about three years, so... Um, don't trust me on that. Various problem areas that still need to be solved. Some of these things don't actually have good solutions in the real time tree yet, so they're not ready to move into the mainline kernel. Ask me if you're interested in the details on those. And the removal of the big kernel lock, which is the legacy of the 2.0 days when we scaled the two processors. It's still there in various places. It, it creates latency problems and so on. It has to come out. People are starting to work on that. That's a big janitorial task. Then the last real time thing that I would mention is deadline scheduling. Sort of an in interesting new approach. Real time, especially POSIX real time, has traditionally been based on the idea of priorities. If you assign priorities to tasks, the task with the highest priority always runs first. And that's how you guarantee that you, you get your responses. But the people working in the real time area don't really think in these terms anymore. They, they tend to think in terms of deadlines instead. So they developed a new approach to scheduling that they call deadline scheduling, where every real time task has three parameters associated with it. There's what's called the worst case execution time, which is just the amount of work that we need to do a deadline, when that work must be done, and a periodicity, how often that work has to be done. And the combination of those three characterizes a real-time task. Given those parameters, a, a deadline scheduler can actually guarantee that every task will get its work done by its deadline, and it does that by, by refusing to take any task that it can't actually service in the time that it needs to do. So you can, you can really take the term, determinism to the point you need it. We have a deadline scheduler, in the works for Linux. It works, um, does this sort of stuff now. What it is lacking at this point is um, solutions to a lot of the thornier problems, like how do you deal with priority inversion in a deadline environment, some of which is still really a research task. There's a lot to do. So it's going to be a little while yet before we actually have a deadline scheduler in Linux, but it's coming. And it will um, be useful in a lot of areas, including things like, like media players and so on, and actual skip free. Um, video display, that sort of stuff, will be well served by this kind of a scheduler once we have it. Okay, containment. Trying to contain groups of processes or systems within another system. There are two approaches to containment that we see applied to Linux and elsewhere. One is virtualization, where you take each contained system and you make it think that it's actually got its own dedicated hardware that it's running on. Virtualization is nice in that you can run different operating systems and different guests. You can run Windows on Linux and whatever, do all that sort of stuff. The alternative is containers, where instead of doing this, you actually just sort of draw fences around groups of processes all running on the host kernel. So containers on Linux all must be running Linux-type systems, but um, the, the trade-off that you get in turn for that is, is much better performance. You can usually run a whole lot more containerized systems on a, on a single host than you can run fully virtualized guests. On the virtualization side, the, the problem is mostly solved at this point. There's still some Zen code which hasn't made it into the mainline tree. It needs to be worked on. But there's not a whole lot to be done in terms of making it work. There's still performance work to do and a whole lot of user space management stuff. On the performance side, to just touch quickly on a few things that have gone in recently, all having to do with memory management. There's a thing called KSM. I have kernel shared memory. I was recently told it's actually been rebranded to, I think, kernel same page merging. It goes and it looks for pages in the system that contain identical data. When it does, it throws out the duplicates and makes all the users share the same page. 
This happens a lot, it turns out, on virtualized systems where you have duplicated data from, from different copies of the file system image or all that. It especially happens a lot if you're running virtualized Windows guests because for whatever reason, I'm told Windows keeps a whole lot of pages containing nothing but zeros around. So they're all, um, they're all duplicated. You can shrink them all down to one. You can greatly increase your memory utilization by using this. This was merged for 2632. For 2633, we have a related technology called comp cache, compressed caching. This just turns, it takes a region of memory, turns it into a swap device, swaps memory to memory, but it compresses it on the way. And also, again, does, does merging of identical pages in the process. So um, you can, again, get much better memory u utilization. They claim that you can pretty much double the amount of effective memory that you have by using this. This was merged for 2633. Then there's a thing called transcendent memory, which I always want to sort of adopt a pose and um, say by mantra or something like that. It's a very similar sort of thing based on a more, um, a bit more of an unreliable caching model. Um, Dan will be talking about this tomorrow if you're interested in this sort of stuff. It's an interesting approach. But it is, it's kind of aimed at solving the same kind of problem in a, in a bit of a different way. On the container side, the story is a little bit different because the problem is a lot harder. If you're trying to do containers within a, a Linux kernel, you have to draw these namespace boundaries around every globally visible resource in the system. This includes file systems, the processes that are running on the system, the network environment, even the system time is a globally visible resource that you have to, to put a namespace layer around. So they've been doing this for years. It's a multi-year project. They're getting close to the end of the namespace part of it, but it's still going on. Then there's the whole addition of resource controllers, like the IO bandwidth controller that I mentioned before. So you can give each container a certain percentage of the disk IO bandwidth that's available to you. And then the, a longer term project they're still working on is checkpoint restart, where you actually take the state of a container, serialize it, and save it to disk, then resume it at some future time, perhaps on a different host entirely. So you can use it to implement migration, that sort of thing. That's a really hard job to actually serialize the state of a process in a way that you can reliably restore it at some future time in a way that is secure, for example, against manipulation of the file and, and secure against changes to the kernel. It's really hard. I don't know that they're actually going to solve this, but that doesn't stop, stop them from trying. We see patches going by every now and then. So that's where we stand with containment. Last challenge is hardware. I used to talk an awful lot about hardware on, um, on Linux because we used to have an awful lot of hardware support problems. But we don't really anymore to the extent that we did. Hardware support is nearly universal. We support more hardware than just about any other system out there. Um, there's just a few remaining problems. Graphics has been a problem, but as I've talked about a few times here, we're getting close to the end of that. And graphics, I think, by the end of this year is not really going to be a big problem anymore. There's a couple of talks later on um, about graphic support that I would recommend seeing. Um, Dave's talk tomorrow, Carl, uh, speaking on, on the future of uh, getting the GPU to do stuff on, on Friday. Then there are issues with some network adapters. This is the usual uncooperative vendor problem where they won't tell us how the hardware works and we have to try to reverse engineer it. The same old sort of stuff that, that we've dealt with for years. Um, the, the number of uncooperative vendors is shrinking, but they still exist. And, um, the best thing that we can do in this regard is to simply avoid such vendors. We really do not need them anymore. Um, and then finally, I mentioned the staging tree has helped us a lot to, to kind of round out our hardware support. But there's not much else to say. We've, we've got good hardware support at this point. So I've covered the material that I came to talk about. Hopefully, I got a couple of minutes for questions. There's, there's a microphone here to use if you've got a question to ask. And um, I'd be glad to, to answer questions that you might have. This will have to be uh, reasonably quick. <laughs> We're running short of time. The issue I, um, I'm concerned with is inclusiveness um, in the kernel developers group. Looking from the outside, it seems to be that it's pretty difficult for uh, new developers to be accepted. It's... It, I mean, Con is the obvious example, and there have been others. But just um, lurking on LKML, it, it seems to be that it's fairly difficult for, for new talent to come in, and yet you're asking that the out-of-tree work should be brought back in. Thanks, Rick. I have a slide on bringing in new talent that I took out to, to make the talk fit. Um, it's, it's always a concern. It's something that you should be thinking about. I, I would say 
in our defense that any development process that takes code from 2,700 developers over the course of a year ha can't be too exclusive, right? Um, but it can be intimidating to come into. And so there have been a lot of us who've done a lot of work giving talks, doing classes on how to participate, writing documentation on how to do it, um, going to various parts of the world where, where people have a harder time being part of our process. There's been a lot of work done to try to to make it easier for people to come into our community. There's been a lot of work done to try to make the, the mailing list a friendlier environment. In fact, it is a much friendlier environment than it used to be. It um, is often, I think, friendlier than some of the stuff you see on, say, the Ubuntu lists anymore. Um, things have improved a lot. There's, there's a lot further we can go. And I think that um, it can be pretty hard to work your way up into the higher levels of the development community. It maybe gets a bit cabalish towards the, the core kernel. But even there, you see people who do it. So it's a concern. We can always do better. But honestly, I think we do fairly well. I think we do fairly well. You know, there are certain high-profile cases of people who bounce off the process. And I could talk at length about Khan, but I don't think I'll do that here. Um, we can talk about that later if you want to do that. But We've got time for one more question, I think. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you could briefly um, talk about regressions, particularly for as hardware gets older and older and less and less people have it, um, it becomes harder and harder to, to uh, keep it maintained in new kernels. I've got a four-port Tulip Ethernet card that some, somehow no longer works, for example. So I guess I'm not quite sure of the questions. We're talking about regressions. Um, regressions are certainly an issue, something that, that the kernel developers work at tracking pretty hard. And keeping older hardware working can be a problem, but usually, as long as there are people who care about hardware, it will continue to work. If something breaks, somebody will report it and we'll fix it. It's very hard for, for maintainers to support all hardware because there's a ton of it and they can't possibly have it all. So things will break. But if people test out kernels and, and report regressions, usually they get fixed. There's a big focus on, on not releasing kernels with regressions whenever we can avoid doing that. Did that answer the question? Yes, I think uh, we've we used up our time quite uh, substantially. <laughs> um, many thanks to John. A little gift from the uh, organisers. Thank you very much. Always to uh, right. hear more well, about well, that. Well, thank you very much. I'd just like to encourage you all to, to be part of our process. That helps us to meet the challenges and to have fun with it. And, um, thank you very much.